Seahawks fans, wherever you may be. Thanks for listening to the show. Join your hosts, Bill Alfstead and Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, Seahawks fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alfstead, sitting down with co-host Keith Myers, here to talk Seahawks football and uh, get away from the loss against the Cincinnati Bengals this last Sunday. We're in our midweek show. We're just talking uh, updated stats and DVOA standings and uh, a few players that are standing out. We're going to go over the injury report and any updated injuries that we can scour and find uh, that will impact the roster this week. Hey, Keith, how you doing? Welcome in. Yeah. Um, well, we've already got, we've already kind of rehashed the game um, the last show. Let's not do that again, but yeah, it wasn't particularly fun. Um, I'm ready to just move on and, um, you know, jump in and do the next thing. And, uh, you know, we got some news about uh, some injuries and some guys that are, that have been returning and some guys that have been out for a bit and are now going to be out a little longer. Um, so let's kind of get through there. What, what do you want to start with? Well, I was just going to talk about the team in, in general a little bit before we get to the injuries. I know the injuries are really important, but I just kind of wanted to go over some some things. You know, in consideration uh, of the loss, I really didn't think that the team overall took a huge step back, uh, if you will. We were competitive uh, throughout the entire thing. We were just lacking in, in red zone conversions and third down conversions. I think that was the difference. Um, and, and then allowing the pass rush and kind of having that impact, um, the game a little bit. We can talk about those things in general. We don't have to tie it into the game, rehash that thing. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I came away a little bit more positive at this time of the week. Now we're in at, at uh, Wednesday, um, than I was on Sunday or Monday, um, in the respect that I thought the defense played exceptional. And beyond the the couple of touchdowns they gave up early, I don't know what that was about. It just didn't seem like Seattle was kind of ready uh, to go out of the gate. You mentioned some scripted plays earlier in the week. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know exactly what accounts for Seattle not being able to get on the field and being ready um, to I turn into the performance that they had after those two drives. Like, yes, yeah, I don't know if it was so much um, Seattle's defense as just the very precise execution of plays by uh, Cincinnati, which is why I mentioned the scripted plays. Cause that's what it was. It was like, the, it was the first 15 plays of the game, which were scripted and their um, execution on them was flawless. Um, after that, you know, Seattle was able to turn up pressure a little bit and um, Cincinnati's sharpness decreased because of, you know, they're not on the, they're no longer on the script and the combination was enough for, basically sales defense to just win um, throughout the rest of the game. Yeah. You know, and I think it's, you know, so far I'm really pleased with the balance of the team so far. Obviously the offense has struggled a little bit more than I thought they would out of the gate this year. Hopefully they can kind of pull it all together a little bit. We'll see if that happens this week as we face the Cardinals. There's only four teams uh, in the top 15 in DVOA uh, for offense, defense, and special teams combined. Uh, the Chiefs, the Eagles, the Jaguars somehow in there, and then the Seahawks. Um, that's that's an indication of a pretty good, well-balanced team, and I think we're seeing that. I would love to see the offense be able to turn it up. If the offense kind of comes to the table in the way that we anticipated that they would at the beginning of the season, uh, this team's going to be a, a difficult team down the stretch, um, and I'm here, I'm here for it for sure. <laughs> but I, I wanted to talk Absolutely. about pressure percentages really quick. Uh, and in uh, running them by you because it involves the offensive line, obviously. Last year, uh, left tackle, 26.4 pressure rate at, uh, through five games. This year, 26.2, basically even. Left guard, 13.2. This year, 19.7. Uh, there's been some, you know, uh, Lewis has been in and out of the lineup there. Uh, center, 13.2 last year. This year, 6.6. Evan Brown effect. Uh, mm-hmm. Right guard, 25.3 last year struggled there uh this year 9.8 uh, anthony bradford's played four out yeah. of the last uh, five games so uh, and right- um i would say that it also shows where gabe jackson was in his career because he came right. over as a and haynes they split time 
Yeah. I mean, well, they, yeah, but they, they more split time later early in the season. It was Gabe Jackson kind of exclusively. And you could see he just had fallen off a cliff as far as performance wise. He was great, you know, the year before. And, um, but that level of play just was not in him last year. Here's one you'll like right tackle 19.2 last year, this year. 42.6. Mm -hmm. Ouch. And that's a Jake Curhan directly, um, (laughs) directly on that one. Uh, Quarterback, uh, they threw this uh, in 13.2 last year, 9.8 this year. Uh, That's when Gino creates his own pressure by his movement in and out of the pocket and so forth. Running back 6.6 this year for uh, 4.9. So, you know, I just I wanted to mention that only because there's really one standout issue. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see that uh, get better on the left tackle there. I would love to see that in the teens somewhere. It's 26. It needs to be lower. Obviously, we, Charles Cross has been injured. Um, I thought that Forsythe has played as about as well as you can expect from that spot. Uh, Cross came back. I thought he just wasn't conditioned enough to make it through that entire game. Hopefully that improves here in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, I just want to mention this guy, Anthony Bradford, run blocking standout versus the Bengals, 90.5 grade, first in the entire NFL in week six. Yeah, um, Bradford has looked good since coming in and uh, finding his spot uh, as a starter. Um, Way better than I expected, given what we saw in camp and in the preseason he looked yeah. like a guy with tr- tons of potential but wasn't ready and it took like one extra week and then suddenly he was ready i guess um because when forced into action he's been good he's been what i thought he was going to be when they drafted him um and yeah i i can't you can't say enough good things about him he's he's played really well um and that's great. That's that's great to see. And then you know, Olawatini's also played good in the middle when he's had um, his chance to. So that's another uh, another spot to be um, be happy with. Those are great draft picks, uh, are they not? By John Schneider in the last two years uh, on the oh, yeah. offensive line, plus uh, signing Evan Brown in a, a two point five million dollar free agency deal in the off season. Um, that, which leads me to kind of my next question really quick as we move through this subject. Um, next year, uh, you can anticipate Bradford holding that spot down. Haynes has been a one-year contract. He's often injured. I think the writing's on the wall there. Oh, yeah. Um, at center, though, and Aaron Brown, Brown's been playing great. He's mm-hmm. probably a top five center in the in the league right now as far as pro football focus grade is concerned. Um, and pressure rates and so forth. He just hasn't allowed any pressures, which is uh, amazing. But given the fact that we do have Olotimi, and really Olotimi is a one-position player, do you consider, uh, and Lewis is a one-year deal, but he's been injured, and he gets injured a lot, it seems, um, the last several years. But he's in the last year of his contract. Do you uh, re-sign uh, Evan Brown in the off season, number one. Number two, if you do, do you slide him over to the left guard spot and allow Oluwatimi and Bradford to complete the offensive line that we can move forward with together uh, for the next three or four years, all under I contract? Mean, I would say, I think, I think it comes down to cost um, because I, I do think you you move to Oluwatimi at center next year. What we've seen as he's come in is he's been plug and play ready. Um, Evan Brown's been great. Uh, and that's the only reason why Olo Timi is not on the field, you know, more um, because when he has played, he's been good. So um, that's been uh, just for the cost value. Um, now, as far as what to do with Evan Brown, like if you can resign him for a reasonable number and stick him at left guard, do it. If because he's playing so well this year as center, somebody offers him a boatload of money to come be their starting center, you let him go. And it sucks because you don't, you don't want to lose players that are good like that, but you've already got his replacement on the roster and you just wish him luck because he's, he's earned a really big raise. And if someone's willing to give it to him, take it. Like what else do you say? Right. Um, would it be the Seahawks or would you advise against that? 
even if it I means think, a move to the left guard spot. I think he is a really good center. I don't know if he is a good guard. Um, we saw last year he struggled um, some when he was asked to be guard full time. Um, he's a good center. I would leave him at center. But Seattle doesn't need him at center because they have Olotimi. They drafted their long term solution at center. And so there's sometimes that. you let sometimes you have to let the 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 roster dictate, you know, yeah. where you spend your money and and where you. Uh, don't. I mean, he's a he's a good player and he's playing out exceptionally well and a really good guy in the locker room by all accounts and all of that. I just am trying to be practical and and you know you've only got five guys. Uh, on the line when people are healthy and um, you know having two centers that are both starter caliber um, is only helpful if one of them is not healthy so I wanted to ask you a team philosophy roster um, and scheme question and that's uh, the offense and defensive efficiency on third down and in red zone I want to just read this out and then we can comment third down of uh, offense 30th in the NFL red zone offense 20th in the NFL third down defense 30th in the NFL red zone defense 32nd in the NFL. Is there any correlation between the offense and defense here? Uh, or is, is that just a coincidence? And um, if there is a correlation, is there some sort of team philosophy or scheme that, that we could point to, for the issues that we might be having, or is this just a personnel thing where guys just aren't, aren't no, I don't, I don't think it's a personnel thing. Um, but I also don't think they're related. Um, they're independent problems. Um, the third down issues that the offense is having is coming from um, teams knowing how to dial up pressure on Seattle. And when you dial up pressure, and that means you have Jake Herhand one-on-one because uh, Disley can't help. He's got his own guy on the outside. Curran's going to lose. And that's, that, that's just what we've seen. Um, and you know, that's the kind of stuff that, uh, what, so what happens when you have so many backups playing? Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think, I think really think that has more to do with the problem there. Whereas the defense for them, it's more, it's much more scheme. Um, it's because it has a lot to do with the way that they play. They, um, they play zone with the idea that you can complete a pass underneath. We'll come up and make the tackle, but doing that means giving up six yards and they give up six yards over and over and over again. And it often means second and short third and short. If it is third down, um, and it makes it easy an easy conversion. And, um, we saw in um, the Bengals game what it looks like when it works. Be patient and move the ball little bit by little bit by little bit for a long drive in order to get down and into the end zone. And the Bengals, which are a good offensive team, outside of the first two drives, couldn't do it. They, they, yeah. they, they, they would make a mistake here, make a mistake there, and it would kill a drive. Um, and so, And that's really by design. Um, so we've seen it work, right? And so I, I don't think that's going to change. Um, we'd like it to. Uh, I think that, um, you know, getting Jamal Adams back has helped. It really has. Um, and I think that they're going to continue to find ways to, you know, be better on first down and, and that kind of stuff. So that third down is harder. Uh, but overall, I mean, they are just kind of what they are um, there. Uh, the red zone defense is very, um, that's disturbing. 32nd in the league in red zone defense. That means when teams get into the red zone, they score touchdowns. And what happened to the bend but don't break, right? That's breaking. Right. <laughs> I um, think I, I texted you, break, uh, bend, 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 break. Yeah. Um, was our, was our, you know, at least against the first two drives. 
Mm-hmm. Um, get a, you know, observation. Geno Smith was pressured 46% of his dropbacks against the Bengals. We tied that into third downs in red zone issues. Um, specifically, you know, when, when uh, Geno has protection, he has a, uh, a grade of, of 90. Uh, pro football focus grade of 90 when it's a clean pocket. Uh, on 26 uh, dropbacks uh, that he was kept clean, he competed 90, or excuse me, 79% of his throws for 244 yards and a 90 grade. On the 22 plays he was under pressure, he completed 47% of his throws with a 41.8 grade. Yeah. Um, and that's directly correlated to being rushed on third down, you know, as mm-hmm. far as blitzing, turning up the, you know, it's an obvious passing down and so forth. So what I mean when um, I say pressure is production. Even if you don't get the sack, you just getting pressure on Geno Smith um, makes him a below average quarterback instead of an all pro. Right? Now, then those are the difference of the two numbers, the two sets of numbers. Yeah. You just, you just, uh, without pressure, he's an all pro. And right. with pressure, he's not good. Yeah. There's only four quarterbacks ahead of him on um, a clean pocket um, grade. Jared Goff, surprisingly, number one, 92.3. That's actually not that surprising if you've watched him play this year. That's true. He's been, Lamar Jackson. He's been really good. Lamar Jackson, 92.2. Josh Allen, 92.0. Matthew Stafford, 91.5. And Geno Smith, 90.0. Patrick yeah. Mahomes, 80.7. At Dak Prescott, 76.3. You know, et cetera. Um, couple of players I just wanted to mention stand out. Uh, Pro Football Focus highest grade uh, rookie wide receiver in week six, Jake Bobo. Um, Devin not, Witherspoon. Not Jackson Smith and Jigba, but Jake no. Bobo. Yeah, yeah, nice. the Bobo. More Bobo. <laughs> Devin Witherspoon, seven combined interception and a forced uh, and forced incompletions combined this season, third in the NFL. Uh, ranks among all cornerbacks. He missed a game, the, too. I know. Ranks among all quarterbacks in the NFL this season. Overall, he ranks third with an 84.4 grade. Run defense second. Pass rush first. Coverage grade 13th. He was 76.6 uh, after the first uh, game, but second after his first uh, after that first game overall at 87.8. So he's he's definitely trending in the right direction. The other guy that's trending in the right direction as well is Trey Brown. He is the fifth ranked cornerback in coverage with a minimum of 100 snaps, 83.2 grade. Against the Bagels, he had 29 pass snaps, two targets, zero catches allowed, one interception, one forced incompletion with a zero pass. Yeah, see, this is where allowed. this is where um, uh, Pro Football Focus's data breaks down to me. Yeah, I know because I, I can I, tell. I, give I can. Props. I, I mean, can it's only tell one you, game, but. I know, and I know, but I can tell you that he gave up uh, more than zero receptions in that Bengals game. He had a great game, and I'm not trying to take that away from him, but he did get beat a couple of times, uh, not for big plays, but underneath. Um, so for them to say that he gave up nothing is just factually incorrect, um, and that's this is why I don't put a lot of stock into into those things, um, especially for defensive backs. If you're not on the field, or you're not in the um, the field of view for the in the broadcast angle, um, pro football focus is pretty poor as far as their their what they what they um, what how they evaluate and I and then I just think that that that's kind of a kind of a show there. I'm not starting to say he has been training in the right direction. He's been good. He was he was really good in this game, um, but let's not oversell it and say that he was perfect because he wasn't. I mean, he just wasn't. Yeah, he was pretty good though. You know, the reason I bring these up, too, by the way, is I have a pro football focus uh, subscription so I can kind of add add these things to the to the color uh, and flavor of the show. Uh, but but I appreciate your feedback as well, because, uh, yeah, I'm sure they're not flawless for sure. Uh, Boye Mafi, according to pro football focus, Mafi is the 15th highest graded edge defender against the run 22nd overall among players with at least 100 snaps. And we've seen that, you know, you oh, just yeah, have the eye test good. with Boye Mafi. He's got sacks in, in each of the last three games. Like yeah. three games in a row. That is um, that is the sign of a very productive edge player. Um, and the fact that he's playing against the run as one of the top edge players in the league 
Um, he's and we a, saw that last year too. So just reaffirming what we what we saw last. Oh, year. he's been he's better just, than last year. Yeah, yeah he's yeah, just yeah. straight up been better than last year at all phases of everything. Um, really is uh, most improved player on the team. Like I, I know that was kind of the the quote and and what everyone was saying in camp. But you go look at the tape. He was pretty good last year. He's really good this year. All right, so I'm going to read directly off the injury update uh, report, um, and then also we can talk about a few other players as well that aren't on this list, but we'll include anyway. Uh, Evan, these players didn't practice. Evan Brown with a hip. Excuse me. Uh, Zach Charbonnet with a hamstring. Uh, Jake Curhan with an ankle. Apparently he rolled that ankle in the first quarter of the Cincinnati mm-hmm. game and continue, continued to play. We can talk about that a little bit in a minute. Uh, DK Metcalf with a uh, with his ribs and hips, just kind of given the the day off on a Wednesday. Limited participation um, is Charles Cross with the ankle, Phil Haynes with a calf, Damian Lewis with an ankle. Um, the fact that he's on limited participation that's uh, good news for Damian Lewis. Uh, Tyler Lockett hamstring, Artie Burns hamstring, and Trey Brown with a toe. Um, Pete also indicated in his press conference uh, this afternoon that Abe uh, Lucas is not ready to return this week. Um, Just coming out early in the week and saying it. Um, Mm -hmm. So that begs the question, Keith, does, does Seattle run Curhan out there one more week or do they call up a guy like Jason Peters is on the practice squad. And by the way, Peters Peters also has a quad injury. Yeah. Peters isn't ready because he's got a quad injury and um, probably isn't uh, um, available. I think that, if Curran is still gimpy with that ankle, um, crosses in there on one side, you've got Forsyth, um, who has played pretty well. Um, let him play. Uh, I, I would, I would run. He's, um, I don't want to take like Curran hasn't been great against the pass, or you know what I mean, like as as a pass rush um, or pass blocker. Uh, can, that's, can I can I tell you what Kerhan's done in the last four games? Sure. Fifty six point two grade against Detroit, forty nine point one against Carolina, twenty point two against the Giants, and forty one point six against the Bengals. To say that he's been poor is an understatement. He's been but, awful. And that's been um, as a pass blocker. Yes, correct. Yeah. But how, what is he as a run blocker? He's probably slightly better. He's paired signif- with paired with Bradford. That's been a pretty decent. Better. Yeah. Um, they, yeah, they get right. a lot of push on that right side. And that's what he is. He is a guy that is a mauler. He will grind you yards uh, in the running game. But as a uh, pass blocker, he's he's just not it. Um, and when you've got a guy like Forsyth available, who's kind of the opposite of that, he's a he's a um, a pass blocker who's not as good you know as a run blocker i think you've got to make that swap um given kerhan's injury simply because you can you can make geno smith better you make geno smith better by cutting down on the pressure this team wins games um i agree and yeah it's important to get the running game going and all of that but ultimately the passing game and geno is more important um, in the grand scheme of things, I would play Forsyth. So a couple updates. Um, just got a tad bit of information on Kobe Bryant. He was placed on injured reserve last Saturday prior to the game. He has a toe injury, same injury he's had at minicamp in June. That one took about five weeks for him to heal. So if he's mm-hmm. on the same pace, for example, he would be available um, at the end of November, basically. Um and uh, Kenny McIntosh still unable to practice. Um, Derek Young still unable to go at all. Mm-hmm. So there's no movement on those guys. I'm a little surprised there with Derek Young, um, but it is what it is. Um, other player moves. Cody Thompson signed to the 53. Um, uh, wide receiver Cody White signed to the practice squad. Undrafted guy out of Michigan State in 2020 past three seasons with the Steelers, both up and down on their roster. Um, Tackle Greg Island, you know, uh, spent some time on the practice squad last year with Seattle. He's back now, signed to the practice squad. 
um, and Holton Allers has released quarterback Holton Allers. So yeah, Allers they're just shuffling. On, yep, yeah, he's been on and off the practice squad. Um, I'm not surprised that Island's back, given the fact that um, Lucas isn't ready, Peters isn't ready, um, Kerhan's got a bum ankle, right? Uh, that means you've got two and a half healthy um, tackles, and you you just you can't run with that. Um, you've got to have um, another body. And we know that Island's not a great, he's not great. He's a practice squad guy, but the team knows him. He knows the offense. They know what they have in him. So they know how to game plan around um, what he does and doesn't do. And uh, so it makes perfect sense that he would be the guy that is, is brought back in. Um, And I would be surprised if he isn't elevated um, to being uh, in uniform. Uh, for this week's game. So uh, you mentioned game planning, and that just uh, brought up a thing that um, I wanted to talk to you about, and I didn't have it written down, and I kind of forgot about it. And uh, so since you, you kind of went there, I wanted to talk to you about um, Shane Waldron a little bit and the fact that Charles Cor- Cross came back at left tackle. And then Seattle kind of went away from uh, 12 and 13 personnel, having an extra tight end and helping out some of those tackles. Uh, on, on some of the passing plays. And he also uh, put into the offense this last week plays that stretched the defense a little bit, took more time to develop. That combination was kind of lethal, especially down the stretch for Seattle. I thought that was one of the one of the issues that I had with this game. There's some yeah. blame to go around with Geno Smith. There's some blame to go around with the blocking. But I also think Shane Waldron needed to recognize that especially in the second half to make some adjustments, uh, knowing that he was going to have pressure coming on Gino. And I didn't see that adjustment at all. Well, I think that's fair. Um, you look at it and you say that, um, you know, they had cross back. And so they're like, oh, we've got cross back. We can go more into our um, conventional game plan, what, what they thought they were going to be able to do. Um, before the season, before the, the two tackles both got hurt at the same time. Um, and I think they took the training wheels off a little too fast um, or maybe a little too far. Um, they needed to continue they needed to ease him in, right? He, he, he's been out for um, four weeks and to throw him out there and expect him to be 100% um, might have been too much to ask. It also might have been... It, where he did okay early on, but then struggled later because of some conditioning or maybe the, um, the ankle got sore or whatnot. But you're right. Like at some point recognize that it's not working and make some adjustments. Like you get, um, go back to the 12 and 13 um, personnel, uh, get, put a body next to him on the outside and let, um, you know, Fant chip him before going out into or out. Um, that way, it makes it easier on him. I I just, I would agree. I think they they should have made some of those adjustments and didn't. Um, But I also don't know if, um, you know, we don't know uh, with all of it, if it, if it, like how much of it is on Waldron, how much of it is on uh, position coaches that at the end of the game, we're sending out uh, Parkinson a lot more onto the field rather than a guy like Disley, who's a better blocker. Um, and we don't know uh, when they get to the line and uh, Gino and Brown make the line calls. Uh, if they were basically not keeping tight ends in where they should have, and instead freeing them up to go out into routes and then having it beat, you know, bite them. Um and so these are things that that are kind of unknown. And so I guess some of that's on Waldron, some of that's not. Um, but ultimately, I think it's a fair criticism that this team uh, got crossed back and are like, oh, everything's great. Let's go back to our um, our normal like offensive game plan. And it didn't work because he wasn't ready. Yeah. Well, I think that was, uh, that was a little bit of it in fairness, you know, cross, I think allowed one sack and, and three or four pressures. It wasn't a, a hugely poor performance. I think the big 
issues were still over on the right side with Kerhan, especially on the last play. I don't know if you keyed in on the last play or the not. La- yeah, I mean the last the it last offensive horrendous. play was was Kerhan, but the whole last um, two possessions um, were bad up from Bible tackles. That's true, um, and and I'll I'll be honest, Evan Brown up the middle too. They were just coming from everywhere. It was it was nuts. Yeah, I mean they were that was that was their game plan. They figured out that if they just brought pressure, that Gino and company couldn't handle it, and that was that's a problem. Because when they bring pressure, you've got to go to, um, you know, there, there's no double teams. You've, you've got to be able to man up and, and do your thing. And guys just got beat. Cross got beat. Curhan got beat. Brown got beat. Um, Names got, got beat. beat. <laughs> um, and yeah. I think the only guy that I don't remember seeing just getting beat one-on-one um, was Bradford. So, uh, it worked. Now, if I'm Arizona coming up this week, I'm watching what, uh, the tape of, of what Cincinnati did and I'm bringing people on every freaking play until they, yeah, and that's, and they that's fine. It. Arizona is a different, now Arizona is not a, a bad defense and we'll go over, uh, in our next show, we're going to do a preview. Um, Arizona is, is not a bad defense, but they don't have the personnel that Cincinnati has on, on defense to be able to, uh, effectively get to the quarterback, even with sending, uh, five or six guys and their defensive backs aren't, aren't quite as good as, as well. So, um, while they can say that they're going to do that or, or in fact, try, um, I think that Seattle's hopefully in a better position to, to take care of Gino in this game. Um, cool. I think we're all caught up for our midweek show and, and, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, good things, um, still, um, going on. We're three and two. Um, it's not the worst possible case scenario. Uh, I think that we do need to kind of figure a few things out, get some players healthy. I would really love to see Abe Lucas back. I think that would solve a whole host of issues on that offensive line, but we're going to have to wait at least one more week for that to happen. And um, I don't feel as tentative about the Cardinals as I did about the Bengals. And, well, um, you shouldn't because the Bengals are a good <laughs> football team. Yeah. And Arizona Arizona is a team that plays hard. Yes. But they're not good. But they do play hard. They, it, it, If you sleep on, on them completely, you will get beat. I mean, that Ari- or, um, the Cowboys showed that. Uh, but if you take them at least the least bit seriously... Um, they may push you because they're going to play hard, but they're not talented enough. Right. And I think that's really what it comes down to. All right. Let's get out of here, Keith. Uh, find Keith on Twitter at Myers NFL. You can find me at NWC Hawk. The show is at Hawks Playbook. You see uh, Hawks and or all of our podcast platforms, YouTube uh, as well. Um, you can find us on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, pretty much everything that's out there, all your, uh, your, um, platform, uh, applications on your phone, just search Seahawks playbook podcast and, uh, it'll come up, make sure you hit the subscribe button and, uh, you won't miss an episode that way. So until next time, go Hawks. Go Hawks. Seahawks Playbook podcast listeners. Thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.